So we continue with our series, The Minor Prophets for Beginners, uh, Majoring in Minors. This is lesson number seven in that series. And uh, this lesson is on the book of Jonah and it is part two. We're studying, as I said, the book of Jonah, who was the last of the prophets serving in the Northern Kingdom before it fell to the Assyrians in 721 BC. I said that we noted in our last lesson that Jonah's character was a mix of uh, good and bad, mix of good and bad. For example, the good, he was capable of powerful preaching that was demonstrated while he was on the ship with the pagan sailors. They, they believed what he was preaching. Uh, uh, he was also capable of a precise prediction in the future, another gift that prophets had. Uh, he told the sailors, if you throw me into the sea, the, the, the storm will, uh, will be uh, over, will be calm. And that's exactly what happened. And of course, he uh, was capable of poetic prayer, his prayer from inside the stomach of the fish. Uh, again, uh, beautiful uh, poetry, beautiful words uh, of praise and confidence and thanksgiving and repentance. So, uh, he was a pretty good preacher, uh, but there were also some negative things, also weaknesses in his character. He was prejudiced, especially against the Assyrians. Um, he was also guilty of presumptuousness, telling God what to do, not agreeing with God's plan, if you wish. And also uh, we said pig-headed, stubborn, hard-headed, just wouldn't listen still angry even when God appeal. Imagine the patience of God appealing to this man and telling him, have you considered the children? Have you considered what a big city? Have you considered all of this? Nope, he said, I, you know, I want them destroyed and you're gonna save them and I don't agree and so on and so forth. And we, uh, we also said that uh, the story itself closes with no closure, no ending like some of the other prophets because uh, I believe anyways, uh, there is no closure in, in Jonah himself. Uh, and that's why his book ends the way it, it does. Now, I also said uh, that uh, Jonah was a real person. This is not some kind of Old Testament parable. This is history. Uh, as mentioned earlier in chapter one, verse one, it says that he was the son of Amittai, mentioned in 2 Kings 14. Jonah was the prophet who served during the reign of Jeroboam II in the eighth century before Christ. One of the things uh, that we notice is that not all of his prophecies are recorded, but one of his major predictions was that the Northern Kingdom would have peace from its enemies to the North. This was fulfilled later in the reign of Jeroboam II. This may be why he was reluctant to go to Nineveh in the first place. He wanted them destroyed. It would have been one way of fulfilling his prophecy. So I said last time uh, that uh, we, um, uh, we would talk about lessons, lessons learned, uh, if you wish, uh, uh, from the book of Jonah. Uh, lessons for the Jews. I want to begin with lessons for the Jews. When the Jews who knew Jonah, who knew his life and his prophecies, when they had read his book, it contained several lessons for them. And usually in preaching, uh, I've mentioned before, uh, before we go on and make a modern application, uh, we need to also make an application for the people who first heard the message of the prophet. So what are some of the lessons that the Jews uh, learned from Jonah's preaching? Well, here are a couple. First, that God is the God of all men and women. He is the God of all. The Jews tended to be rather exclusive with God, thinking he was only concerned with them and their well-being. And this story showed them that God is the Lord of all, not just one people. Uh, they were to be a light unto the Gentiles. You know, God cared for the Jews, he had a purpose for them, and their purpose was to reveal God to the other nations, something uh, which they did not always do very uh, effectively. Another lesson for the Jews, uh, the Jews had the responsibility of being the light of the world, as I just mentioned. 
In Romans chapter 1, 18 to 23, Paul says that the knowledge of God has always been evident to man through the creation, through the conscience of individual people. And in Jonah, we see that God makes himself known through the witness of his people. And so in every age, people have had access to God through his special people. Uh, through the patriarchs before the time of Moses, through the Jewish nation uh, before Christ. They're the ones that revealed God to the people around them. And actually the Jews revealed God to the nations around them, not necessarily by anything that they did, but uh, by what God did for them in releasing them, in freeing them from Egyptian slavery. The miracles that God did these things were not done you know, in private, they were done out in the open. So not only the Jews uh, who were the recipients of those miracles knew about them, but the nations that surrounded Egypt at that time, they also heard and saw uh, uh, the results of the miracles of the uh, God of uh, the Jews. And of course, the church today, the church belonging to Jesus Christ, uh, after his appearance and resurrection, we're the light of the world today. And we bring that light into the world by bringing God's word into the world, by preaching the gospel of salvation uh, into the world. And so the book of Jonah defined the extent of their responsibility to reveal God beyond the borders of the Jewish nation. In other words, if, if God was going to all this work, to save the Assyrians, their arch enemies, then that said something about God. It said that God was interested in the salvation of everyone and not just uh, the Jewish people. And then perhaps another lesson, God's essential nature is love. Even back then, we tend to think that God's nature in the Old Testament was harsh and judgment and judgmental and only in the New Testament, God is love, you know, as John says, but no, God's essential nature has always been love and was demonstrated sufficiently in the Old Testament. The Jews, they tended to see God as the God of Mount Sinai. You know, thunder, lightning, uh, fear, dark cloud, pillar of fire, something frightening, something, something awesome. The God of the terrible presence of his power, the God of law, the God of justice, the God of punishment, the God of extreme holiness. They saw him in those terms. Jonah's book reveals an equally important and overarching quality of God's character. He is also the God of love and compassion. How do we know that? Because he has love and compassion on the Ninevites, a fierce uh, pagan nation and yet he seeks to save them. He extends his love even to these uh, people. They knew, the Jews, that God loved them, but that he could also love their enemies, uh, uh, love those uh, that had disobeyed and hated him, uh, opened up a new horizon of possibility that would affect their lives and their relationship with God and each other. If you see that God is able to love a hateful person, an enemy, a pagan, you kind of have a little more encouragement for yourself. If you're a believer in God and you're at least making an effort to please him, well, I guess God really does love me. If he can love those guys, well, I guess he can love me too, because at least I'm trying to obey him. So those are some of the lessons uh, for the Jewish uh, people uh, that they could draw uh, from uh, Jonah's book. Lessons for modern day Christians. Certainly the story of Jonah and the whale or the great fish has been a favorite uh, Bible school lesson for generations. Aside from a very powerful story, it also contains so many good lessons for us today. Too many, of course, to mention here. But again, I've chosen just a couple to leave with you um, as we finish up the book of Jonah. First lesson for modern day uh, readers. Uh, Jonah was like we are, a combination of gifts and faults. You know, religions have traditionally gone from one extreme to the other in this area. For example, uh, we're all bad. You have some 
preachers, teachers, religions, uh, they see everything in a dark light. Calvin, for example, John Calvin, Jean Calvin, uh, the theologian, Protestant theologian, he believed that man was totally depraved, that man was unable to make a moral decision without the direct intervention of the Holy Spirit. That's the basic teaching uh, of election. Man is so depraved, so sinful, so morally uh, ruined that unless the Holy Spirit intervenes uh, in his life, uh, mankind, man, woman cannot uh, say yes to God uh, in uh, receiving the gospel. And of course, from this teaching came all kinds of perverted ideas and social practices that hurt us. I mean, the doctrines of predestination and irresistible grace, which became the mainstay of so many Protestants and evangelical denominations, began with this uh, misconception that we're bad, we're totally bad. There's nothing we can do to please God. And of course, unless God chooses us for salvation, then we have no hope of salvation. That's the teaching of John Calvin. And then of course, there's the opposite uh, teaching. We're all okay. That's more in line with what's happening today. We're all okay. You know, this is what we're living through in our nation. Uh, nothing is bad. Everything is relative. You are politically incorrect if you judge anything as bad. You can't, you, you no longer call anything sin anymore. You know, we've gone all the way to the other end. To these extremes, the book of Jonah clearly exposes the truth about mankind. Because we are made in the image of God, we can do some pretty good things, even some godly things that are spiritual in nature. However, because we are sinners, we also have the potential for evil in our lives, sometimes terrible evil. I mentioned this before, but haven't you ever had that moment where you, you, know, you say to yourself, wow, how could I even think of that? How could, I have, how could that thought have even crossed my mind? What kind of person am I to even think of such a thing? You know, we realize you know, the, the potential for evil within us is, is pretty great unless we uh, you know, call on God to help us uh, control that. And so uh, Jonah uh, teaches us that everyone has a combination of good and evil within them. It's not 50-50. You know, sometimes there's way more good than evil or vice versa, but there's always both. And we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the thing that being a parent will teach you. Your, your, your beautiful little Susie darling uh, girl, you know, who's just a perfect angel. She's two, she's three, just, uh, she's all whipped cream and cherries and blah, blah, blah. And then she gets to be, you know, eight or nine and she has a younger brother and, uh, you know, she ties him up in the basement or so. I don't, you know, and you ask yourself, how could you have thought, how could you think of doing such a thing? Poking him in the eye for no reason, you know? You, where did that come from? You say, to, I didn't teach you that. I never teach you, I never taught you that. Or they come home from school one day and they bloop, you know, they burst out a word, you know, they drop some kind of word bomb on you and thinking, where did that come from? You know, how could, how could those words, you know, come out of your mouth? Those words have never even been spoken in the house here. Yeah, why? Well, because uh, we're, everybody eventually, there's some good and there's some, there's some bad, you know? and that's what Jonah teaches us. Even Jonah, a powerful preacher, a guy who spoke what could happen in the future, a man who could uh, express the, the loftiest ideas in a prayer, uh, could still say to God, no, I think you're doing this wrong. You ought to be doing it this way. You know, I mean, yeah. We're all like that to a certain extent. We all need God's help to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, you know, bring the bad down and, and, and accentuate, the, uh, accentuate the good. So that's one lesson from Jonah. Uh, another lesson uh, for us today is that, that God's word is powerful. It still is, always has been. Uh, despite Jonah's pig-headedness, his prejudice, his pride, when he preached God's word, 
it was productive. It worked. The pagan soldiers, or excuse me, sailors rather, they believed. They and their ship were saved. Imagine, uh, he just spoke to them and they, they believed. The pagan Ninevites, they heard Jonah's preaching and they believed and they repented and they and their city were spared from the king, like I said, all the way down to the poorest person. They responded. Even Jonah himself, when he spoke to God, believing in his power, was saved from his predicament. In other words, when he was in the belly of the fish, he called out to God and he knew that God, even from that perspective, he knew that God could save him. So the power of God's word for condemnation or salvation, it reminds me of a story about a young girl and an atheist. This little girl who was a Bible school student was talking to her, uh, her uncle who was an avowed atheist. And he, the atheist, asked the little girl, do you really believe that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days? And she looked at him and answered, oh yes, I do, because the Bible says so. And then he said to her, well, what did he do? What do you think he ate while he, was, uh, while he was in the fish? And she thought for a minute and replied, I don't know. I guess I'll just ask him when I get to heaven. And he thinking that he had her said, well, what if he doesn't go to heaven? And she smiled and replied and said, well, then you'll have to ask him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So God's word is powerful, powerful to save, powerful to build, powerful to transform, powerful to correct as well as to judge and to condemn and punish forever. Take seriously when the word of God said, God saves you and you are saved and you are his and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Take that seriously. But when God says, if you do this, if you fall away, if you reject, you're lost, take that seriously as well. Unfortunately, people take all the good stuff seriously and the judgmental part, the, you know, the warning part, that they don't take seriously. So this is why those of you who choose to make the church attendance and, and, and Bible class a, a priority over the many pressures and activities of the world, you're wise in doing this and you're wise in teaching your children this because you're filling up on the kind of power that you need to deal with this world effectively and eventually to move into the next world. And then one other lesson that we get, God is a God of love and forgiveness, thankfully. When I look at my life and my failures, I'm so glad that God is a God of love and forgiveness. The shining truth of Jonah that spans for centuries is that God is not only the same God, but that he's a loving and merciful God. Check it out. He was merciful to the sailors. They were pagans. They worshiped idols. They were involved in terrible practices. They were not searching for God, but God went and searched for them and he found them through Jonah. It was no accident that Jonah was on that ship and his preaching saved those sailors. He was also merciful to Jonah. His sins were greater because he knew God, but he disobeyed anyways. Despite this, God in his love per pursued Jonah. He could have just killed him. He could have just left him in the belly of the fish. When Jonah was in the belly of the fish, God went there to hear his prayer, to witness his repentance and to draw him out of his grave. When Jonah was angry in Nineveh, God blessed him anyway and was patient with him while Jonah was angry. And God was merciful to the Ninevites. They were not only pagans, but they had attacked and killed God's people in the past. And yet God still felt compassion for them and he reached out to them. And when they repented, he saved them and their city. Of all the lessons of Jonah, the one that is repeated over and over again is that God is a loving and merciful God and that he will forgive and save those who come to him in faith and repentance. As John says in 1 John uh, 1 uh, verse 9, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe me, I've repeated this verse to myself many, many times uh, since I've become a Christian. You know, none of us will probably be in the belly of a fish. Uh, I don't think that'll happen to any of us. But sometimes we're in the pit of depression. Sometimes that happens. And sometimes we're in a battle with sin and we're not winning. And sometimes we're overwhelmed by doubt or fear or guilt or discouragement. During these times, let's remember the God of love and mercy who can come to us no matter where we are and save us and forgive us as we believe and as we trust in his word. I ask you the question, are you in the belly of a fish as far as your life is concerned? Or your marriage is concerned? Or your health is concerned? or your finances are concerned? Which reminds me of a quote from Mother Teresa. Don't usually quote her, but she was a Catholic nun who served the poor in India for a good portion of her life. She said the following, God did not put you in this world to be successful. He put you in the world to be faithful. So many of us chase success when we should be chasing faithfulness. So for this reason, I encourage everyone to call on God in prayer and faith, and he will answer you. And of course, if we can minister to you in any way, don't hesitate ever to call on the church for direct help or encouragement, for prayer, for healing, for forgiveness. Well, that's our lesson on uh, the book of Jonah will continue next time with another prophet from the minor prophet. Thank you. God bless you. Appreciate you being here.